Let's pretend that this moment is the ending scene of a dance movie. But you just turned it on. You don't know what's going on with the story, okay? I'm a lead character. I walk out to the edge of the stage, turn my back, bend my knees, and proceed to do an epic backflip off the stage, landing perfectly like a TED Talk superhero. <laughs> Now, I guarantee that this moment would make you feel really cool and make me feel like I'm on top of the world. You might even look at the person next to you and smile and nod and then point at me and say, that guy can dance. But if the movie ended right then and there, and I did nothing else, just walked off the stage, what tangible idea could you, the audience, take away from my performance? So the point is, and I hate to break it to you, but you're kind of watching dance performances all wrong. Now, I know what you're going to say. You look me in the face and say, well, Stephen, I love dance, and I love watching dancers. But what you're actually saying is I love watching people be a spectacle for my enjoyment. <laughs> I call this audience entitlement. <laughs> and I would like to suggest a new way for you to view and understand dance. But look, I used to be exactly like you. I was in love with the spectacle of movement. And what's not to love? I mean, seeing dancers perform feats of athletic prowess is exciting, and it's pretty sexy, too. So when I started my dance journey, I was completely in awe with movement that could wow a crowd or woo a girl. I would sit in my room and watch dance movies and music videos and pick out the coolest moves and then try to mimic them. But see, the true artistry of dance was just a tiny kernel in the back of my mind. I was instead drawn to choreography that was extremely flashy and oftentimes not artfully driven. And if I'm honest, I still low-key enjoy this type of choreography, but the difference between then and now is I have a much clearer understanding of performance and dance and also commercial art from my years of working in the industry and also from my academic studies. So I can make much more knowledgeable connections when viewing dance as a form of art. But see, this is sort of where the problem lies. This little phrase, art is subjective. And in a perfect world, it should be, right? You like what you like because you like it. End of story. But see, in reality, we as humans want objective truth. I mean, especially in art. It's just way easier to have guidelines, you know, things like playlists, top 40 radio, reviews, star ratings. These things tell us what's good and what's not so good, and then we subjectively decide if we agree. But see, the more you know and understand about a subject like dance, the better off you will be in forming your own opinions about it. So my goal here is not to make you see dance how I see it. I'm going to simply give you a short, guided tour instead of a process to give you a different perspective of the dance and choreography process. So, in my creative practice, I do a lot of things. I'm a performer, I'm a dance teacher, I'm a filmmaker, a photographer, an editor, and a choreographer. Now, see, in most of these images, you can clearly see process or at least the creative outcome of that process. And in addition to that, you're probably aware of what performer, dance teacher, filmmaker, photographer, all these things do and how, pretty much how they do them. But one of these things is not like the others. Choreography is different. See, when you usually see choreographers in media, you're seeing the end of their creative process, which actually involves the detailed teaching of movement to the dancers and then the fine-tuning of that movement to make them performance ready. But what about the first half of their creative process, the process behind the creation of the movement? See, that's much harder to show because it mostly takes place in the mind. So let's take a deeper dive inside my brain to see how I personally perceive dance and movement in relation to sound and overall visual language. So for me, one of the greatest applications of dance is the creation of movement that is a physical representation of, the, of a particular piece of music. Now, just let that sink in for a moment. What I'm saying is that dancers have the ability 
to perform movement with such a quality that could potentially allow an audience to see the music. Now, this concept of perceiving a singular sensory experience in multiple ways is actually called synesthesia. And it's the easiest way for me to explain what the heck is going on inside of my brain when I create dance. So, the most simple definition of synesthesia is a blending of the senses. And so for me, this personally manifests in that I see music and colors, and I see music in moving forms and shapes in three-dimensional space. The colors represent emotions, and the moving forms and shapes represent melody, rhythm, and the overall quality of the sound. Now, I do realize that this symbiotic and somewhat complicated relationship between dance and music that occurs within my brain is kind of weird and a little bit outside of the norm. I mean, even as a dance teacher, the core learning outcomes I want my students to take home with them are, one, a more complex and nuanced understanding of music, and two, to be able to express this through dance. And so, my music knowledge is not really of the traditional sense. It came from my dance career. I mean, I've probably danced to thousands, if not tens of thousands of songs in almost every style and genre of music. And in doing so, I've had to learn these songs from top to bottom. Every lyric, every note, every beat, every accent, every imperfection. And so when I combined this practical understanding with, of music with the way that I perceive music in colors and shapes, it's the basis of how I create dance. It's musicality. And it's probably the most important part of my mental creative process. So you're probably wondering, well, what's musicality, Stephen? I'm going to tell you. I define musicality as the transcription of the rhythm, tone, lyrics, textures, and melodies of a song through dance. So the goal here is to translate the music into the visual language of dance in a way that directly or indirectly complements the auditory and emotional qualities of the song. And the dancer's job is to interpret, ingest, and then express these emotional and creative ideas through their performance. So I think I've probably talked about this enough. I probably should show you something. So I created a piece to demonstrate this for you today. So with this, I started with just an idea. And then I sat down and I composed a piece of music. Then I let it sit for a while. Just enough time for me to remove my ego so I could listen to it as if it were the first time. Okay. So then my next step was to take that music and visualize it into a piece of art so I could show you what's happening in my head. And it looks something like this. So just imagine this in three-dimensional space, moving all around you and through you in every way and direction that you could possibly think of. So from there, which is the fun part, I began translating this visual idea that I see in my head into choreography. So then I got with a couple of my friends that happened to be dancers, and then we put this choreography on video. Filmed it in one shot with no editing so that you could much more easily, easily see the visual language and the musicality of the piece. So let's check it out.
So, when I created this piece, I had a clear agenda in mind. But ultimately, it's your prerogative to view my work however you want. I mean, if I'm honest, I hope you liked it, but if I'm honest, I hope you were inspired in ways that I didn't even imagine or even intend. But when artists have to create a thing to help sell another thing, the audience's reaction and engagement actually drives what we are commissioned to create. And in turn, the audience tends to feel entitled to and sometimes even expects a specific type of creativity. Now, this cycle keeps being repeated over and over and over and over and over and over again. So, but today, I'm going to challenge you, the audience, to disrupt the cycle by using two simple ideas, okay? Number one, why before you wow? <laughs> so when you watch dance, try not to put so much value on spectacle or tricks. Before you say, wow, ask yourself, why? Why is this particular move being used, and how does it affect the emotional and artistic impact of the piece? Okay? Number two, free your mind, or AKA the Morpheus. And like the character from The Matrix, this is alluding to making a purposeful mental shift to free yourself from past ways of thinking. So again, when you watch dance, try to find a new entry point to understanding. Maybe, maybe think about the process behind the movement, or maybe put yourself in the shoes of the creator. Or better yet, put yourself in the emotional mind state of the dancer. So, I have a confession to make. When I started this talk, I began by telling you that you're all watching dance wrong but I was kind of being a jerk to get your attention. <laughs> the truth of the matter is there's no right or wrong way to watch the beautiful art form of dance. I mean, because there's infinite ways. But allowing a data-driven, objective truth to tell you what's supposed to be good or entertaining is actually hindering you from enjoying and seeing the creativity behind the dance performance. And I really want you to see it. So in my creative practice, my creative practice sometimes involves making the unseen visible through choreography. My hope is that by sharing this process and simply giving you some new ways to view dance, this idea is now permanently with you. And you can't unlearn it. <laughs> and maybe it's changed something inside of your brain. Just a small change that will transform the way that you see dance from now on. So in a weird way, I've actually choreographed a shift in your thinking. <laughs> and now, you're a part of my creative process too. So I feel so inspired and good right now, I think I could almost do a backflip. <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> Thank you.